So anyways, there you go. Verification of property condition, not grounds for stopping the close of escrow, but it does allow you to pursue action post close of escrow. You can actually, you can have a conversation with the listing agent and the seller as you're trying to, because, you know, per the new RPA, it says that the verification of property condition will happen five days prior to the close of escrow. I always recommend editing that, filling in the little blank to 1-5, so it can happen anytime in the last five days of the close of escrow. And I do like doing my verification of property condition as close to the close of escrow as possible, usually the day before. There's lots of things that can happen in a 24-hour window um, that would negate whatever you put on that form. So if you do it five days in advance, I mean, my sister's house, when she was selling it down in Southern California, they did their verification of property condition. I don't know. It was like a week before the close of escrow. And then there, um, they had a cinder block wall separating their house from the house next door. And it got really windy one night and knocked that wall over. So it's not just like a fence that you can like nail some new boards on. It's actually like a cinder block wall. Um, and, you know, so there was a potential they wouldn't have seen that until after the close happened and after they were getting keys. So, right. So a lot can happen. All that to say there, there's a lot that can happen. Um, in that time period between your verification and the close of escrow, you always want to make sure you note it, that you uh, make anybody aware of it as soon as possible. Um, but that would allow the buyer to pursue action post-close of escrow. So anyways, I do it one to five days and try to do it as close as possible to the close of escrow. Um, and you can have that conversation with the agent. You can call up the other agent and be like, hey, so there's water all over the floor. Like, how are we going to fix this? This was not the condition of the house when we entered into escrow. Um, in this case, just so everybody knows, my buyers did decide that they were fine with it. They're replacing the roof anyways. We got a substantial credit from the seller already um, for some other repairs that we think was probably more than necessary to cover those repairs. And so they were like, we're happy. We're, we're not going to worry about it. Don't even bother them. So I did make the other agent aware that there was some water leaking and damage and stains. And obviously the roof was leaking um, to see if he would offer any remedies or solutions um, and do the right thing. And the, he hasn't yet, but anyways, they were, they were good to just move forward with life. So Anyways, you never know what you're going to find in the world of real estate. Um, any questions before we jump into today's topic and I officially start class today? Nope, those were some good uh, tips there. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, getting started. We are covering lead generation today. I do not have a slide deck to share with you. I have lots of content. Um, if you want some of this content in a in a hard format, let me know. I just have to take it out of where I'm getting it from and put it into a different format so I can do that for you if you'd like. Um, yes, please. Okay. <laughs> the lead generation, right? So this is going to be the key of your business. Anytime I talk with an agent and they're like, man, my business just isn't where I want it to be. I'm like, what are you doing for lead generation? And they're like, well, not really anything. I knock on some doors a couple times a month or maybe once a month or every couple of months and then that's it, right? So without lead generation, your, your business is dead. I promise, dead in the water. There is no business, okay? So if you have a problem with business, it usually comes back down to lead generation. If it's not lead generation, you're doing lead generation consistently, then we need to talk about your scripts and dialogue. Um, but that's another topic that we can go into on a future date, right? So, um, so usually lead generation is the cause. It's just, it's a numbers game. Real estate is a numbers game. So if you're getting through enough people, you're having enough conversations, even if they're really crappy conversations, you will get some yeses in there. I promise. Um, that being said, if you want to help your turnover rate, practicing your scripts and dialogues, knowing your objection handling, that's going to help you move forward at a faster rate. So when we look at lead generation, we think of it as like a funnel, right? Everybody knows what a funnel is it's big at the top, small at the bottom, right? You use it to like pour liquids into a jar. I used it last night to put my dinner in mason jars. Um, we have the <laughs> funnel. The top of the funnel, the biggest part is your prospecting and marketing, okay? That's going to allow you to capture people's information and have conversations with people. Our goal is that then we're going to convert those people that we've captured into either leads or contacts. They're either going to be leads where we can offer them like a one-way offer-based type touch programs. We're trying to get them to respond to us. 
versus like contacts where it's an interactive value-based interaction that we're interacting with them. They're interacting with us. Okay. So prospecting and marketing into the funnel, in the middle of the funnel, you've got leads and contacts kind of sharing that top end of the funnel. One, we're either getting one way communication. The other way is a two way communication. And then we're going to work to make those connected leads, right? So we're going to work to make those leads connect contacts. And then we're going to take those contacts and we're going to funnel them down towards the bottom to cultivate them into transactions. Okay. Makes sense. So prospecting and marketing lead to leads. We're going to take those leads and convert them into contacts and then take those contacts and cultivate them into transactions. So that's what the funnel kind of looks like when we talk about real estate. Now, lead generation falls underneath that prospecting and marketing, okay? And keep in mind that as we run our real estate business, we want to be prospecting based and marketing enhanced, okay? And you're like, Amy, what is the difference? Well, the difference is that prospecting is going to be that conversation, right? It's it's voice to voice, face to face. We're interacting with people versus marketing is going to be like sending out those mailers, putting out those uh, social media posts for open houses. That's marketing. Okay. So some suggestions or some um, examples, there we go, searching for the word, some examples of prospecting would be things like calling for sale by owners, calling expired listings, um, talking with our contacts to get referrals, right? Um, we are going to con connect with our allied resources. So those would be like our vendors or business to business type relationships. We have farms, geographical farm or demographic type farm. Um, we can door knock, we can build relationships with builders, right? New home communities um, or just builders in general. Great way to partner up on vacant lots. We can build relationships with banks. You know what banks don't have? They don't have real estate agents. They always have mortgage divisions, but they don't have real estate agents. So build relationships with those banks. Um, third party companies, investors, door to door canvassing, client parties, networking events, um, social functions and community events, seminars, booths at events, teaching and speaking opportunities, kiosks and high traffic areas. Um, you can, you know, obviously phone calls would be prospecting, text messages, um, interacting with direct messaging on your social media platforms. Um, any of that would be considered prospecting. Does anybody have questions about what prospecting is? Okay. In addition, there's marketing. So we want to be prospecting based and marketing enhanced. Okay. Some examples of marketing would be things like advertising in newspapers, on vehicles, in magazines, bus stop benches, you know, grocery cart signage, um, your signs or directional signs, right? Open house signs, a sign in the yard of a listing, your name badge, logo t shirts, advertising, marketing, um, billboards, yellow pages moving vans, brochure boxes, car signs. You might do marketing via broadcast with things like um, ads, promotions, um, uh, email type marketing. It might be online advertising where you're doing like pay or online marketing, which would be like pay per click, SEO, social media, um, different portals there. You could be doing farming, right? So farming is both prospecting and marketing. So you can do geographic or demographic farming, direct mail, right? So postcard campaigns, special events, um, sending mailings to expired or FISBOs, just sold, just listed market updates, promotional items, um, sending out magnets, calendars, et cetera, uh, uh, public relation type things with news releases, advice columns, sponsorship, right? Open house event, um, charities, schools, sports teams, all those fun types of sponsorships, okay, community events, fun things. So that would be marketing. Now, the easiest way to describe marketing and prospecting and show you the difference would be with your farm, okay? And the reason it's easy is because it makes more sense. So let's say that we have a farm area, which we'll dive into further, but let's say we have a farm that we're 
um, frequent area of repetitive marketing, right? Farm frequent area of repetitive marketing. So we're frequently and repetitively marketing a certain group of homes. And once a month we go knock on doors. Okay, when we knock on the doors and we have conversations with people, that's prospecting. When we don't have a conversation with somebody and we leave a door hanger behind or a postcard, that's marketing. When we throw something into their mailbox as a bonus item once a month or every couple months, marketing. So conversations, those face-to-face, -face, those interactions, that's prospecting. The We're backing it up with additional marketing. So somebody might be like, you know, on a farm, you might have, um, you know, door knocked recently and people saw you walking around having conversations, right? Interacting with people. Some people saw you on their ring doorbell and chose not to answer the phone or answer the door rather, right? And then they get something in the mail and they go, oh, that's who that person was that I saw on my ring doorbell. Or I saw her walking through the neighborhood. I wondered what she was doing. I thought maybe she was selling solar, right? Now they know that, hey, I'm not selling solar. Next time I come answer, knock on your door, you can answer it, okay? So um, just some fun things there. That's the difference between your prospecting and your marketing. So when we talk about lead generation, we wanna be prospecting based and marketing enhanced. Okay. Any questions about those two things? Okay. When we dive into lead gen, you should have five legs of lead gen. At some point, you guys are going to get tired of me hammering this into your brain, but it's going to just keep happening. Okay. I'm a firm believer in this. You should have your sphere of influence or your database um, or your circle of influence, you'll see it as COI, SOI, either of those are circle or sphere of influence. Those are the people that you are already interacting with. They know you, they love you, they trust you. You see them on a regular basis. You're having conversations with you. Somebody says real estate, they say Shauna, okay? Cheerleaders, our circle of influence, our sphere of influence. It also includes people that we interact with that maybe aren't our cheerleaders yet, but they are people that we are interacting with. Our kids have sports teams. We go fishing with a group of people on a regular basis. We have a bowling league. That's all part of our sphere of influence or our circle of influence, okay? That should be, that should be your database. Those people that are already in your database, that is that group of people, okay? That's one form of lead generation that should be your main form of lead generation as are, are during your lead generation time is reaching out to those people. And you may be like, Amy, but my people, they're not going to sell their houses. That's great. I don't really care. They probably aren't. They probably will. You'll, you'll be surprised by people that actually decide to sell their houses, but they know people that are looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate. And if somebody's not looking to sell their house, maybe they're thinking about real estate investing. In fact, maybe hosting a real estate investing class, right? With some sort of, um, you know, investment type person and offering that to your database would be a great way to get people to show up and think outside the box of this isn't just, I have to sell my house. I could actually buy additional houses for some passive revenue streams in the form of monthly rent, right? So anyways, so we're going to contact our sphere of influence, that circle of influence, that database. That's your number one leg of lead gen. Your second leg of lead gen is going to be your leads from listings, okay? When we think real estate, we need to think, how can I get listings? Buyers are fun, but ask Anastasia. She spends hours a week driving around showing people properties all over the Bay Area, right, Anastasia? Seven days a week. Seven days a week showing properties. Do you know what you don't have to do with a listing? You don't have to get in your car and go show properties. Okay. So listings take less time. Okay. To me, a listing is a little bit more stressful. I'm going to be honest. I, every time I have a listing and I'm working at, I'm always like, I hate listings, but I don't have to put people in my car and drive them around or show them properties. So they take less time. In addition, listings should generate additional leads, okay? We should have a sign in the yard. People will call the signs. My most recent listing on Heritage Lane in Dixon, um, we had people calling off that sign. We had, in fact, um, we picked up two or three um, potential buyer leads from sign calls off that listing, okay? 
In addition, you can be marketing that listing on social media. You can be marketing it um, in the neighborhood. If you have your own listings, you probably should be hosting your own open houses in those listings, which allows you then to go market to the neighborhood about the open houses. We're generating leads from those listings. Even if open houses aren't your thing, you should probably host them in your own listing. Okay. Um, statistics tell us that somebody who can see that sign in the yard is going to list their house for sale. Okay. So go out and stand next to your sign, look around at all the houses that can potentially see that sign and go door knock and make friends with all of those people. Okay. So two legs of Legion, two of our five are going to be our database and leads from listings. Okay. If you don't have listings, that's okay. That one will come. Okay. The other three legs of Legion are going to be things that you're going to choose based on what you think sounds like it would fit within your values. For me, part of my values is fun. If it's not fun, it's not happening. Okay. If every time I go out to go host an open house, I'm absolutely miserable. I'm going to take that out of my realm and figure out something else. But we're going to pick three additional legs of Legion. We're going to pick one that we're really going to focus in on, okay? So we are focused in on our database, we're focused in on leads from listings, and we're focused in on number three, leg of legion, whatever you choose that to be. You're going to develop systems and processes around that legion, and you are going to be consistent in that legion activity, okay? We're going to have a couple other things that we're tinkering with on the back end, but that we're not really focused and spending our time on, Okay. So for example, I have my database, I have leads from listings, maybe my third leg of Legion is going to be social media, my fourth leg of Legion is going to be a farm, and my fifth leg of Legion is going to be open houses, okay? I'm really working to develop systems and processes around Facebook or social media marketing. I'm spending most of my, most, most of my time diving into that realm, working to generate leads through my social media. In addition, I'm probably hosting one or two open houses a month um, and you know, not spending a ton of time on it, but I am spending some time on it. And in addition to that, I am doing my farm once a month, okay? Again, might not be spending a ton of time. Maybe I'm not developing systems and processes around it, but I'm still doing it, tinkering. It's just not my primary focus. Once I've mastered my social media lead gen efforts. I've got my systems and processes in place. I'm consistent in it. I'm doing it. I'm going to keep doing that. In addition, I'm going to turn my focus to focus in on my second leg of lead gen, which was my farm. And I'm going to start developing systems and processes around my farm and growing that leg of lead gen so that it's producing results. Okay. Once I've mastered that, then I'm going to move on to open houses. I'm going to develop those systems and processes around open houses and work to master that to make it a lead generation machine. Um, okay, so we're going to be generating leads all three ways, but we're really putting our focus into that main one. Okay, um, as a new agent, open houses are a really great, easy way to generate potential leads. Okay, everybody who walks through that door is either looking to buy or sell a house. So it's about picking the right house, um, doing it. So if you're like, oh, I'm not sure what my lead gen method is going to be, it's a really easy way to create instant results, okay, by consistency in those open houses. If you don't have listings, that's okay. Reach out to other agents in our office to ask them if you can host their listings open. If they don't have any open or listings right now, check in with our agents on a regular basis that often have listings and say, hey, do you have anything coming up in the next couple of weeks, right? Because ultimately, if we're putting an open house game plan together, which I think we have a whole class on open houses, um, it's going to be a systematic process throughout the week. So we want to identify, ideally, if we could identify a potential listing that we're going to hold open a month from now that's getting ready to come on the market, that sets us up for success in our marketing and prospecting leading up to that open house, right? We can develop those systems and processes. So it doesn't have to be a listing that's on the market today. We can talk with other agents and find um, listings that are gonna be held open are gonna come on the market in the future that we can hold open, um, right? So we can do things like that. Um, does anybody have any questions about why we developed five legs of Legion? No, ma'am. Everybody's good. 
All right. Um, when we dive into our database, which I told you should be your um, number one method of lead generation. Okay, we're gonna connect with the people who already know us. Okay, please focus in on that. And people shy away from this because they're embarrassed to call their friends and family. They don't wanna bug the neighbor down the street, whatever it is. But then you're gonna get really frustrated when the neighbor down the street that you failed to tell was you were in real estate or remind them that you were in real estate. They decide to list their house and they list it with somebody else. You're gonna get really frustrated and irritated. Okay, so make sure you reach out to them. Our contacts inside of our database, we should have a systematic process for reaching out to those contacts in our database, okay? We want to be systematic in it. So you want to range right around 36 or more touches per year or connections with those people. Okay, and you're like, Amy, that's a lot. No, it's really not, I promise. Okay, so here's what that's gonna look like. It's gonna look like a quarterly phone call plan. There's lots of methods that you can do to remind yourself to call your database on a regular quarterly basis. It also means that you don't have to call everybody today. Um, you know, over the next three months, you can begin reaching out and calling those people. Okay. There's a program called like DT, DTD2, DTD2, right? Do the database too. That one breaks it down alphabetically by the most popular or um, average number of last names per letter in the alphabet and it pairs them up together. Okay. So like A and W get paired together, right? I think it's like uh, B and D or something like that. I could be wrong on that. But anyways, they get paired together differently. If you Google D, D, D2, I'll try to remember to post one into the folder for this class that will get shared with the video. Um, then you know that, hey, the first week today is week one and week one, I'm going to call A and W. And then next week I call B and D. And then the next week I call whatever is scheduled for next week, right? So we have a systematic way of doing it. It covers the full quarter. We're just going to every week pick up our list. We're going to call through those names. We're going to start all over on month four. Okay. That way everybody gets a phone call once a quarter. Okay. I highly recommend anytime you reach out to somebody with a phone call, you do it with a three-step approach. What that's going to look like is on Monday, I'm going to call through my list of people that I'm supposed to be calling through in my database. I'm going to call them up. If they don't answer, I'm going to say, Leticia, this is Amy. Um, sorry I missed you today. I was just wanting to touch base to see how you were doing. I'll touch base with you later this week. Okay. Didn't ask them to call me back. Gave them permission, in fact, not to. And I let them know, I prepped them in advance, hey, I'm going to be in touch with you later this week. On Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm going to call again. If I don't get them this time, I may not leave a message. I may send them a text message. The text message is going to sound very much the same. Hey, it's Amy. I was just hoping to connect with you. I wanted to see how things were going. I'll try you later on this week. Okay, a day or two later, I'm going to call them again for the third time. Call number three, ring, ring, nobody answers. I'm going to leave a very similar text or voicemail message. It's going to sound something like, hey, Leticia, it's Amy. I was just calling to see how things were going. I hope you're doing well. I'm sorry I missed you this week. If you need anything real estate related or not, please don't hesitate to reach out. I hope you have a great day. I'm also going to send a text message that says basically the same thing right? Because some people listen to voicemails, some people read text messages. So I want to appeal to both. So on the third attempt, I'm going to do both. I'm going to let them know. I'm not telling them, hey, I'm not contacting you next week, but I'm just saying, hey, I'm here for you. If you need anything, I'm going to put them back in the list. I'm going to call them again in three months. Okay. Eventually, maybe they'll start taking my phone calls. By the third one, I'm reminding them, hey, I'm here for your real estate needs to remind them that I'm in real estate. Okay. Three-step approach every time I make a phone call to a potential lead or contact. Okay. Any questions about that three-step approach? Okay. We are also going to make, keep in mind too, that if you did that um, systematically, right, that's actually three touches per quarter instead of one, but we're just going to count it as one. Those are all bonus touches. Okay. Um, in addition, you're going to send them out a monthly email. It can be a newsletter. It can be a, here's some things you should prep for the house. If you go into our um, one design, there's different postcards and stuff with recipes. There's um, 
holiday greetings, whatever, find something that works for you and send it out to them on a monthly basis in the form of an email. Okay, you can set them up on an auto email campaign um, in our one um, suite as well on a drip campaign. Okay, in addition to that monthly email that I would recommend goes out around the first of the month or maybe the middle of the month or maybe the end of the month, pick a time and have it just go for all your clients around that same time. You're also going to send them a monthly market update. Okay, if they own a house, we're going to do it specifically for that neighborhood. We, I would do it through Real Scout, and I showed you in a previous training how to set that up through Real Scout so that they get a monthly email that shows them what's going on in their neighborhood if they own a house. If they don't own a home and you know that, man, they're renting in Fairfield, then maybe we want to set them up in Real Scout with a monthly market update of what's going on in all of Fairfield, right? Or maybe we want to set them up for a monthly list of the homes that came available in the starter home range, right? Or something like that. We want to send them some sort of secondary email. So they're going to get two emails a month, one newsletter, one either with a market or listing updates. Okay. In addition to those, you should work on inviting them to two events or get togethers or parties. If you're like, Amy, that sounds scary to me. It's all right. It's going to be all right. I promise. Um, there is national night out every August. Pick a park, register it with your national night out invite everybody to join you for national night out. It costs you absolutely zero, zero money out of pocket. You get to interact with people, mingle with people. You've served your event for the year. Sometimes the office hosts fun events that you can invite clients to, right? Invite some clients to those events. So do two events, get togethers, parties. You could host like a um, hot chocolate bar in the office. You could host a um, pie day, right? We just had pie day. You could hand out pies for pie day where they actually have to come to you instead of you going to them. So there's lots of different opportunities there. You could do it for Thanksgiving as well. And then you're going to do four touches or four connections each year. So probably once a quarter where it's a promotional direct mail top buy type item. So either you're going to drop something off on their porch or send them something in the mail um, for those additional touches, right? So it might be something like a calendar magnet for their fridge, although most people's front of their fridges aren't magnetic anymore. It could be a, maybe once a year you run a, compa a comparative market analysis on their house and you drop that off or throw that in the mail to them, right? A generalized market analysis, say, hey, here's the approximate value of your home. If you want me to further refine this, let me know, right? So you can send something like that in the mail. That's actually a really great method. Um, if they're maybe they don't own their home, they're renting, you could send them just like, you know, four steps or five steps to home ownership. Okay. So just some fun things you can send them in the mail, super simple and easy. Um, you can also send them, you know, birthday cards or home anniversary cards. We might celebrate, um, a random day in the middle of the year, happy m, &M day, right? Like whatever random day you pick, you can go Google days of the year and it'll show you all the random things you can celebrate. Um, send them something random and fun, something that's going to catch their attention and that's going to continue to remind them that you're in real estate. Okay. Do we have any questions about those types of contacts that we're going to make with our database on an annual basis? No, ma'am. Okay, four calls, 24 emails, two get togethers, four promotional or direct things in their mail or on their doorstep, and then a couple of cards per year. Okay, pretty simple, not too scary. You can set them up systematically too, right? So you can set it up in your one suite so it sends you reminders every time something's due. We don't have to do all of our, like if we're going to do some pop buys to our clients where we're going to drop something off on their doorsteps, we don't have to do them all in one day. We could spread it out over the course of the entire quarter. We could spread it out over the course of the month, right? So uh, we can make it easy and simple. You can group your people by where they live and location and make it systematic. Okay, so those are people that know us in our database. They would recognize our name. They interact with us. We send them a text message. They're probably going to respond to it. Um, that's our touch campaign for those people. Okay, in addition, we want to constantly be feeding our database leads. OK, 
Okay, that's the whole point of lead generation and prospecting. We're continually feeding people into our database. So people that pass through our open houses, people that we interact with on social media, um, people that we come in contact with in our farm. Maybe we are um, doing business to business as one of our methods of legion. We're going to add those business owners into our database. Okay, before we even connect with them and have conversations, we can be adding them to our database. And those people that are captured, but we haven't connected with them yet, okay? So my best example of this is that they're like um, zoo animals versus a pet dog, okay? So those leads that we've captured, they came to our open house, we had a conversation with them, but if I call them today, they might not remember how they met me or what my name was or even the answer on the phone. Those are people that are captured, they're like a zoo animal. We have their information. We have their contact. We know how to get in touch with them, but they may not come when called, okay? Our, our sphere of influence, that circle of influence, those are those people that know us. They love us. They trust us. They at least know our name. If they saw our name pop up on their caller ID, they'd be like, oh yeah, I know Heather, right? They're probably going to answer your phone call. They're probably going to respond to a text message. Ultimately, they're going to come when called like a pet dog, okay? Pet dog, we're going to put more time and energy into, more effort. That's that 36 plus touch campaign on an annual basis. Our leads, those people that we're trying to get to interact with us, we're going to put them on a, what we call a 19 to connect. We're going to have at least 19 interactions with them on an annual basis until they start responding to us. Once they start responding, then we're going to move them into that 36 to convert. We're trying to convert them into clients at that point. So our 19 to connect is still going to have those four quarterly phone calls. So somebody passes through my open house today, right? I had a conversation with them. I'm going to, well, we'll talk about that here in a second, but ultimately we're going to then call them once a quarter until they start answering our phone calls. And I would still do that three-step approach that we talked with with the other one, right? That we're gonna call them three times a week, leave a voicemail message the first time, text message the second time, and a voice and text the third time. We're gonna set them up on those 12 monthly newsletter touches, okay? So same thing that's going out to our, our full database that we're working to convert, that's gonna go to our leads as well. We're gonna send them hopefully two things in the mail. If we know where they live, we have their address, we can track it down. We're gonna send them those two things in the mail on an annual basis and invite them to one event. Great reason to bring them to like a national night out. It costs you nothing. You're inviting people, having a chance to interact with people that maybe wouldn't have come otherwise. Okay, 19 to connect. Any questions about that? Okay. When I first add leads to my database, okay, I go to the, oh, I host the open house this weekend. I've got these lead sheets of people that showed up. Number one, please don't just throw them in the corner and say, I'll do it later. You're not going to do it later. I promise. Put them in your database right away. Take it from somebody who knows you're not going to do it. So just get it done right away. In between people that visit, you can open up your one sweet app and you can add them into the app right away. If you're really bad at that, you can set up the landing page. If you open up your OneSuite app, there's like a, um, a open house registration page right there. <laughs> you can just put have the people put their information right into your database immediately and have it set up to automatically add them to one of the um, touch campaigns, one of the drip campaigns to set them up. But anyways, we want them added to our database. Okay, we're going to put our new people added to our database on a what we call an eight by eight. We're going to reach out to them at least once per month for the next, or sorry, once per week for the next eight weeks, trying to get them to respond, right? We know that the faster we can get them to respond, the more likely it is that it's going to happen versus the further out that we go, the less likely it is. That doesn't mean that we write them off and we stop, um, you know, dripping on them and reaching out to them. We're still going to reach out to them, but we're trying to get it immediately. So in those first eight weeks, you want to do a variety of phone, text, and emails, to try to get them to respond to you, okay? Once a week for those first eight weeks. If they don't respond after those first eight weeks, then we're gonna move them to that regular connection plan for the people that are captured but not connected with. So those would be those at least 19 touches on an annual basis, four phone calls, 12 emails, two something in the mail and one event, okay? 
if you were wanting to go above and beyond, you could add in, um, in addition to our phone calls, we're going to do a text message. And in addition to our phone calls and our text message, we're going to do a social media connection with them, right? Where we either, we make sure we comment on their social media and then maybe also send them a direct message. It's a really good way to cover them on a monthly basis without annoying somebody. So, right. So both of our touch campaigns or those connections, we're going to have a quarterly phone call. So maybe if this is my week for the quarterly phone call, <clears throat> then next month at the same time, I'm going to reach out with them on social media. I'm going to comment on one of their social media posts and maybe send them a direct message, right? I'm interacting with them again on a social level. And then maybe the month after that, so right, month one, month two, month three, maybe month after that, I'm just going to shoot them a text message. Hey, hope you're doing well. I was in your neighborhood. I thought about you today, right? Just something simple. Hey, I was thinking about you. I hope you're doing really well, right? Just something simple. We're working to build relationships. And then month four, we restart, right? We start with the phone call. And then month five, we do the social media. Month six, we do the text message. Seven, right? See, we just keep repeating every three months. So that would be a really good way to really, truly build relationships. If you're thinking, oh my gosh, Amy, I know you're telling me to call people. That brings me anxiety. I'm My heart's beating. I'm starting to sweat just thinking about it. I don't even know what I'd say to these people because I don't call people. Okay, don't use any excuse to not call people. We're going to use what we call a Ford sandwich. Okay, family, occupation, recreation, dreams. Ford, family, occupation, recreation, dreams. You can go on your social media. You can look up, oh, what's Shauna been up to in the last couple of weeks, right? And then you can pick up the phone and call Shauna and be like, hey, Shauna, sorry, it's been so long since I've connected with you. It looks like you've been having a great time, you know, at your kids' soccer games every weekend right? Or whatever it is that that person's been doing, like that gives you a touch point or, Hey, what have you, have you been on any vacations recently? You know, now since COVID's mostly gone, have you done anything fun? Right. Heather would be like, Oh yeah, I went to a concert last night. Right. It was a blast. Super fun. Right. So we want to dig in and build relationship with these people. We're not picking up the phone and being like, Hey, Abby, it's Amy. Do you know anybody looking to buy, sell or invest in real estate? No, you don't. Okay. Click goodbye. Right. Sometimes it's just a check in, especially these people we haven't had conversations with in a long time because the picking up the phone is a lost art. It may just be like, hey, I was just calling the check in to see how things are going. How's your family? Right. Are you still working at Genentech? Right. What are they doing? Family, occupation, recreation, dreams. You don't have to touch on all four. You just want to follow up. Oftentimes that will lead to, oh, what are you doing now? Are you still working at the dentist office? Well, no, actually, I got my real estate license and I'm helping people buy homes. It's super fun. Right. So it allows you to open up that conversation. If during that first phone call, the first quarter, it may not even go into real estate. It may just be relationship and that's OK. Right. We're just opening up that level of communication with them. So when I call them again on month four, they're not like, oh, she's calling me again to ask me for business or why is she calling? Right. So they know that, hey, we're working to build relationships and then we can introduce into the, the real estate portion of it. OK, so that's how we're going to kind of roll these phone calls. Ford sandwich. We call it a Ford sandwich because you open with family every time. Right. So month one, it may be just, hey, we stop at family occupation, recreation dreams. We're just building relationship. We're just checking in. We're just renewing this relationship and real estate may not come up in the future conversations. Real estate should come up. You want to make it purposeful. You want to always bring it up. So you're going to start with family occupation, recreation dreams. We're going to lead into real estate. Hey, do you know anybody looking to buy, sell or invest in real estate? And if they don't be like, hey, that's OK. I really hope you have fun on your vacation in Hawaii or I really hope that your dog starts feeling better. I really hope your job continues to go really well or that you get that promotion right in my database and one suite. I'm going to open it up. There's a little note section I can add that I made a phone call and then I can take notes of what happened during that phone call and what we talked about. So the next time I call them. I can, and I can number one, set a reminder to call them in three months, right? It'll show up as a task on my list. And number two, it'll tell me what we talked about. So I can dive right in. Hey, I know last time we connected, you were up for that promotion. How did that go? Right? Opens the door immediately. I remembered what we talked about. I remembered their dog's name. I remembered that they were pregnant. I remembered that, um, you know, they were getting ready to go on vacation, whatever that is. And I can follow up with that, which helps to open that door to real estate conversation a lot simpler and a lot easier. So you want to make sure you take notes in your database and that you log when you're going to talk to them next. Okay. If it was something that you're like, man, 
they were really stressed over their dog not feeling well and they're taking it to the vet today. I want to remember in a couple of days to call the follow up to see how their dog is doing. Put a task in there to remind you to call back in two days. You don't have to wait four months to touch base with them. You can follow up with them right away. Okay. We're building relationships. Okay. So our leads, our goal is to get them to respond, right? Those are people that we've captured. We're not connected with. We're trying to connect with them. We want them to respond as soon as they start responding then we want to move them over to that 36 to convert. We want to touch them on a more regular basis. Okay. Any questions about those two ideas of connected, how we're going to reach out and systematically touch them and our contacts or those are connected people, how we're going to systematically connect with them. Okay. Um, our lead generation, right? Feeding people into that funnel. We want to make sure we add that to our calendar, right? So number one, you want to define what type of lead gener generation you're doing. Calling your database is one form, right? Those leads from listings and what those other three are. And what does that look like on your calendar? Okay, that time when we talked about calendar blocking or time blocking a few weeks ago or a week ago, I don't remember when that was, it's all a blur. Um, you want to, right, we're going to put our non-negotiables on our calendar first, then we're putting our family and our time off next. And then the third thing that we put on our calendar is our lead generation activities. The lead generation is the most important thing, as I mentioned, to drive your business forward. So we want to make sure that's on your calendar and we want to make sure that time is protected. Okay. Don't ever neglect your lead generation. Things will happen. You'll start getting transactions. You'll get busy. It's really easy to like start picking up your phone and answering phone calls, responding to emails, text messages, dealing with your transactions at hand and forget about that lead generation. And then what happens is you get to the end of your transaction and you're like, oh man, I don't have another transaction now. Back to the drawing board. And then think about it like this. like It's a 60-day window. So any lead generation I do today is going to take 60 days to come into fruition. So if we stop lead generating for the next 30 days, we've lost all momentum and we have to start all over. Okay, don't get to that point. Protect that lead generation time. Um, know who you need to talk with on a monthly basis or on a weekly basis. Know who you're connecting with. Know what your lead gen activities are gonna be in order to drive more people into that database. The people that we're systematically connecting with um, in our database, it's a 12 to one ratio. For every 12 contacts in your database, it will result in one transaction. Okay, that's why we continue to feed our database. That's why we continue to keep it updated. And that's why we work out of our database. That's why our goal is to lead generate and generate more leads into our database. That's why we call the people that we know, love and trust and ask them for referrals so that we can constantly add people to our database. Okay, so that is the goal behind lead generation. There is no wrong or right amount of time for lead generation. What one person does, what Heather does may look different than what Anastasia does or what Shauna does or what Leticia does, right? And it may be different activities. It may be different time blocks. Maybe you have a part-time job, so you're limited. So you're doing one hour of lead gen a day. Maybe Heather's got big goals. So she's like, I'm three hours of lead gen a day. And here's what that looks like. And it could be like on a weekly basis as well versus a daily basis, or it could be results oriented that, hey, I pick up that phone on Monday and I start calling through the database until I set an appointment, right? Or I'm going to go door knock this neighborhood until enough people answer the door that I find somebody that's interested in buying, selling, or investing in real estate, which means that, hey, this week, I'm going to go door knock all the doors and I'm going to make a note of who didn't answer their door. And the next week, I'm going to hit those doors again. And the week after that, I'm going to hit the ones that still haven't answered. And the week after that, I'm going to hit them again, right? Until they answer their freaking door because they're so sick of me knocking on it, right? Whatever that might be, you might be like, every spare moment of my time goes to lead generation. Or it may be that, hey, I need two appointments this week. As soon as I book those two appointments, I'm done. I can quit lead generating for the week. Okay, don't neglect your database calls, though. Those ones that are systematic that you're supposed to be doing every three months because otherwise you'll get behind. You know, the door knocking thing, um, Nathan, that, you know, when we were at KW, he uh -huh. and him did an open house one time um, and he did like 10 houses door knocking right before. And I just showed the he he got the listing for, you know, when he went door knocking 
Um, and so that was last year, like a year and a half ago. And now, you know, he has her listing and I just went to go show it to an investor for him right now, but <laughs> it paid off. You know, I was like, dude, that's so sweet. Like you went door knocking and now you're selling her house. And now you're right. And he didn't give up. He obviously has been in contact and been dripping on this person for the last year in order to get that listing, right? It wasn't, Hey, I door knocked one day and then I left something behind and I walked away and I didn't talk with you again. And then magically you called me 12 months later. No, he's probably been continuing to drip and reach out. So that's why we do it. Absolutely. And that's why we have that, right? I told you to put them on anybody that you connect with. We put them on an eight by eight to get them to respond to us after the initial contact. And then we either move them after that, either they start responding to us on week two and three, and we convert them over to that 36, right? To convert, or we keep them on that room to that 19 to connect, to try to get them to respond. Okay. That is my lead generation in a nutshell. It is so important. If you go to any agent anywhere in our office and be like, hey, is your business where you want it to be? And they're like, no, it's not. You can ask them, what are you doing for lead gen? And they probably won't have an answer for you. Okay, I would say nine times out of 10, they're, if they're not where they wanna be, it's because they don't have a lead generation plan in place. This is the foundation and the core of your business. Questions, ahas, thoughts. I just need to do it. I just need <laughs> to do how it. I feel. That's how I feel. Cause I just listening to you do this, you know, as again, it's like just a reiteration. Like I remember when I, you know, had my open houses going and was doing, you know, 50 doors before my open house and was calling people and just even most recently been trying to like sprinkle on people again, like, you know, get myself back focused again. But it's like, even when I did that, like, you know, like somebody was moving, they're renting, but in, in like my extended family. And it's like, a, I called her and then she's like, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed. She has three kids under the age of four and she was moving and just catching, like then checking back up on her again, a couple of days and then checking back up on her, you know, while they, you know, over the weekend, while they moved, cause they said they didn't need, didn't want any help. And, you know, and then now she's like talking to me, like, okay, how do we like plan to buy, you know? And I feel like it's really helping me to get my plan. Like I have to really, I feel like I want to go a different way, like helping people. Cause I feel like I have so many buyers that I can potentially help in my family alone. Like, in, so I'm like, I want to nurture them for like the next year. Cause a lot of them are like in a year, year and a half, cause I got to pay off debt. I'm like, it's extremed in debt. Right. And so I've actually got with three of them to help them like try to get a debt free plan, you know, yeah. to pay off. So it's like getting a bigger picture, I think, instead of, like you said, just, you know, well, and creating those tools and resources, right? Like, so creating something that goes along. So when somebody is like, man, I really want to buy a house, but I'm so buried in debt. You can be like, great. I've actually got like, you know, a 12 week plan for mm -hmm. that'll help teach you how to move that direction. And then you can drip on them over the next 12 weeks yeah. with those steps of how to get out of debt, right? Or mm -hmm. steps to home buy to increase credit scores, right? Mm -hmm. Talk with some credit repair people. What do, what should people do to help boost their credit score if they're thinking like a year out? And then you can mm -hmm. drip on your buyer's on a monthly basis, that newsletter might be specific towards buyers where you're giving them tips and tricks for things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And being yourself, I think too, you know, being real, like not yep. being afraid to post some stuff, you know, like <laughs> this is the reality of things. I know like, you know, the brokers and the real estate people don't want you to say this, but reality is some people really can't buy right now. You know? Some people really shouldn't buy right now. Mm -hmm. you right? Should, yeah, you have to be ready and, you know, so, yeah. Yeah. I agree. So it was good again. Thank you. Cool. I have a question about, so I contacted my mom's client. She was like, she's looking for a house. Um, you know, she hasn't been able to find anything. I called her. I left her a message. She then was like, oh, cool. You're in this area. You know, we're looking around here. She's She's like, but you know, I must tell you there, I, I am working with the realtor in like Loomis Penryn area. 
you know, but if you can find us a house here, like, so how do you go about, you know, how do you go about that? Yeah. So I would ask them, number one, if they signed any sort of agreement with the agent that they're working with in that Loomis area. Yeah. And if they did, I would ask for a copy of it to see what they specified in the area in which they were going to be buying a home. Okay. I know you just said that. Oh, actually, I was watching over that video when you were your YouTube video when you were going over the the agreement, the buyer yeah. agreement. And I just watched it yesterday. So that's fresh in my head how you said that. Like, you know, you want to be specific. And I remember I think Heather was saying, like, can we just put California? Like also. <laughs> Because I wanted to do that too on some of mine. So, um, but I I was going to ask you, but it kind of caught me off guard. So like, it was kind of, I was silent for a little bit and then I, and then I continued the conversation, but I was like, sure, you know, but she was like, thank you so much for calling me. I'm so glad you called me, you know? Yeah. And, um, so, so I'd start with that. And then I would get her to sign a buyer representation agreement for the areas in which you service. Okay. Um, just so she knows that, Hey, here, if you're going to purchase home in this area, right. And then you begin working with them on that level at okay. that level. Got it. Totally okay. appropriate. Thanks. Yep. Shauna and Leticia, any ahas or takeaways from today's class? No, no, for me. It's, it's, I mean, it's something like Heather said, it's just something that we need to do. And um, these are, but I, I like the, you know, the quarterly calls and emails and the cards too. I think that's something that's pretty doable. So we we can start with that. We can start with that, right? <laughs> start with that. Baby steps. And I'll post yes. that. So I'll put that together on a graphic um, and have Abby send that with the, the video in the comment section. Um, she'll put a link to that as well as on the spreadsheet where all the videos are linked. She'll put a link to that folder that has those materials in it. So it'll have some lead gen ideas and activities, um, prospecting and marketing ideas. Um, and then the uh, what that touch campaign would look like or that connection campaign would look like. Yes, thank you, Amy, for all this great information. Absolutely. And am I saying your name correctly? Is it Leticia or Leticia? Leticia, you're saying it right. Okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Shauna, how about you? Uh, yes, this um, it helps me to get motivated. I've been kind of lacking on doing what I need to do to get some uh, prospect. So I'm going to be doing an open house for someone this weekend. And so that will motivate me to put those into uh, lead generation. Fabulous. Good job. And keep in mind, too, that you're no. never, never, okay, maybe not never, probably never, we'll say probably never, going to feel like lead generation. Okay? It's not something that most people wake up in the morning, they're like, man, I can't wait to go make phone calls today. Maybe Heather, Heather likes to interact with people at Maciel. They probably enjoy interacting with people. <laughs> Most people aren't like, oh, I want to get out of bed and go make phone calls, but we do it anyways. And then, you know, two or three phone calls into it, you're having good conversations. It's not as scary as you think. And then you start picking up momentum. So, um, so do make sure that you set aside that time for Legion and that you do those activities. Um, there is a link to log your attendance in the chat box. So make sure you check that chat box for that. And tomorrow at four o'clock, we will go over the one design suite, that um, studio, one design studio. Uh, Leticia, did you have another question? No, sorry. I was looking for the link to, no. to, do, uh, <laughs> to log my attendance. I'm sorry. You're totally fine. <laughs> hey, hey, so you. are we gonna get um, like the update on the, the rev up schedule. I know you sent it out for the week, but like how you guys had done before. Um, I know. Yes, I will have Abby send out the complete schedule in the group me chat. Okay. So that you guys have the full schedule. Perfect. So I like to put it on my calendar so I know what's coming up. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Miss Amy. Miss Absolutely. Amy. Amy. Yep. Can you hear, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, sorry, I had to jump off for a second. I got a Zillow call. Um, no so did anybody else get an email for car transactions to renew your Lone Wolf 
zip form thingy. Oh. Yeah, you get that once a year. You have to, it'll happen when you log in, it'll prompt you to renew your zip forms. Well, I'm trying to do it and I can't. Find yours, we, Anastasia, we did yours already. Oh, we did? Okay. Yeah, it happened okay. when I was helping you with the transaction a couple of weeks ago or so. Okay. I did get that email too. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. if you didn't get the email or if you did, it really need, it's neither here nor there. When you log into your car forms at some point, it'll prompt you to renew your your forms library and you just click the ones or all and then it'll say zero balance and you hit continue or renew and it it's a silly it's a it's a silly stupid thing but it's it's there and it'll prompt you to do it so you don't have to worry about actually doing anything yeah that's part of our membership right it is it's part of yeah. our membership okay i have another question about the, right. buyer, the buyer rep agreement so okay. let's say she never signed one, okay. you know, but she's like working with that person over there, but I happen to find something and I show it to her. She might be like, oh yeah. Okay. Like let's put in an offer type of thing. So like, should I, if she didn't sign one for those areas over there, should I add that to mine? Cause she was like, I am looking like anywhere from here all the way up over there. Um, I would probably respect the agency relationship that she has with the agent in that okay. area already. Okay. And just stick with this area. Um, just okay. be respectful of that relationship. Unless she's that's like, man, fair. if she was like, well, I have an agent that's been showing me properties, but I'm not committed to that one. And I'd much rather work with you for everything. Then, yeah. then that would be appropriate. But if she's like, she already identified that. Hey, yeah, I think because she's, she was, I just wanted to know how that how that goes because if she was like I don't want to step on people's toes because I know what that feels like and and um she said she did say that she had to put in an offer out there but they didn't get it they got outbid so I'm like clearly if she's working with her like but she's she was like I'm glad you called me you know so that I can help her out here you yeah. know I just wanted to know what that was like and you yeah. know how I should approach that yeah, and it doesn't limit you. So on my my buyer representation agreement, I would just put the specific area for which we kind of talked about that I would help her buy in. But if one day she calls you up, she's like, man, I've really enjoyed working with you. I've got another property over there that I'd like to see, but it's in Loomis or whatever. Are you willing to drive over there and show me the property? You can be like, yeah, absolutely. Or she can work with the agent over there. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. This is why it's important to get your buyer representation agreement signed to people. Don't neglect that step in the sales cycle as we learned yesterday. Protect yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fabulous. Well, it's 12 of you. Oh, yeah. Go I'm ahead. This one real quick. Wow. Not really. Um, just <laughs> I have, I think I texted you as a joke, but this girl's driving me freaking crazy. She keeps contacting me when she's supposedly working with another agent here in Vacaville <laughs> and she keeps asking me questions and I finally told her basically I'm like it's an ethics thing and a moral thing and because you're working with them they should be helping you and she's like well if we don't buy and we want to rent can you help us find a rental and I was like well maybe you should ask your agent because if she wants to hold you as a client, he or she, I mean, if the he or she, you know, they, they, they will help you. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like if that was me and I had, like, I've, I've helped people find rentals recently who obviously cannot because they like, can't even afford more than, you know, <laughs> $2,000, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but it's like, you would go above and beyond, right? That's just my character anyways, me to help people. But I'm like, it's just starting to get annoying. I just, I guess, do I just keep telling her, like, go ask them, go ask them, go ask them. I mean, until she finally clicks or it's like, because well, I, I asked her who it is because I'm like, I even thought maybe I just want to reach out to them and be like, can you, so, <laughs> you know? So here's what I would do, Heather. I would, you've yeah. already redirected her back to her agent. The next time she asks you a question, you can be mm -hmm. like, I, as we already talked about, I can't answer these questions for you because you're working with another agent. But if you would yeah. prefer to work with me, I'm happy to work with you. Just let me know. That's what I said. Yeah, I said that too. I was like, I'd love to work with you. Like yep. if you guys want to, but, and you know, she's like, yeah, well, we're working with this person. My husband decided. And I was like, okay, well then 
you need to work with that person. You need to go work with that person and stop trying to short call me on the backside and ask me all this stuff, you know, find out all this. Can you find out this? Can you find out that? And yeah. So um, just keep, I would just keep redirecting. Always put yourself out there that you're happy to help (laughs) them if they're not getting the service they want from the other agent. Now that being said, you guys cannot solicit buyers or sellers that are signed with another agent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can't like go out and be like, Hey, do you have an agent? Well, you can work with me instead. But these people are reaching out to them, right? So Masiel's friends reaching out to her. Heather's reaching person is reaching out to Heather, which is an appropriate time. So that is when you can have a conversation about it. You have to be really careful that you're not giving agent cited advice during that time period. But you can always offer that they're they're welcome to work with you if they choose to do so. Okay, there's a difference there between soliciting other people's clients and. Um, receiving somebody who's who's searching for help and asking them if they want you mm-hmm. to represent them. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because we're not going after them. But okay, yeah. what's a group me? And then I'll let you go. Uh, oh, no, Heather, you're not in the group me. <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> Sorry, Heather, you're not in the mentor program. <laughs> Wow. Uh, but Heather, I will also have Abby. I think she has um, the ability to post in the Foxhole Facebook group. But if not, I'll have her shoot it over to Carly to post into the Foxhole. Okay. The schedule as well. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Heather. Okay. Somebody can screenshot it to me and send it to me. <laughs> I'll text it to you right now. I'm doing it right now. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Everybody have a fabulous day. I'll see you tomorrow Bye. at four. I will not Thank see you, you. tomorrow. Bye. Okay, I won't see you tomorrow. But uh, hopefully you'll have good news for me tomorrow. Bye. Bye. I hope so.